Before we <clears throat> jump into today's prophecy update, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank all of you, uh, both here in our online church all over the world, for your thoughtful and generous gifts, your kind words and cards uh, to me and my ohana. We were uh, most blessed, and for that I cannot thank you enough. So today's prophecy update is going to be the last one of the year. And I think you would agree that it's been quite a busy year on the calendar of Bible prophecy, if I can say it that way. The prophetic significance of all that happened in the last year is arguably the likes of which we haven't seen in recent memory. So much so that students and teachers of Bible prophecy would do well to seriously consider what may in fact be in store in the new year of 2016. If 2016 is going to be anything like 2015, we may want to fasten our seatbelts. I think we're in for a very, very rough ride. I'll take it a step further and say that if things continue to increase in their intensity in 2016, which I suspect that they will, then it's going to be a very interesting year, to say the least. I'm hoping you'll kindly allow me to quickly do a prophetic year in review of sorts. I do so with the hope of providing a new year preview of what may be coming in the days and weeks and months ahead. January began with the horrific Islamic terrorist attack in France. This seems like old news now, doesn't it? When 12 people were butchered at Charlie Hebdo's Paris office. And the reason was that the satirical weekly newspaper had apparently insulted the Islamic prophet Muhammad in a humorous cartoon. It brought to mind a quote from the President of the United States, who is uh, just a stone's throw away, I guess, when he said, quote, the future does not belong to those who insult the prophet of Islam. Interesting. Sadly, several related attacks followed where there were five more people that were killed and 11 more wounded in the wake of this continued Islamic terrorism that was called anything but. That was January. In February, we watched the political drama unfold as a result of Netanyahu's invitation to speak to Congress here in the United States. Not only was Netanyahu shamefully snubbed yet again by Obama, but there was also a movement afoot led by Obama to defeat Netanyahu in Israel's upcoming elections. And if this weren't bad enough, it was taken to a whole new level with a threat from the president to the prime minister that he would, quote, pay a price. February and March brought the ISIS burning alive of a captured Jordanian pilot as well as the beheading of 21 Egyptian Christians. I'm not showing that image on the screen. None of us will ever forget it. Those Egyptian brothers in Christ there on the shores of southern Libya in their orange jumpsuits before they were demonically satanically beheaded by these demon-possessed Muslims. Nor will we ever forget the anti-Christian narrative that ensued 
and today has continued chiefly from the U.S. president and his administration. March brought us what I believe was the miraculous victory of Benjamin Netanyahu's re-election as the Prime Minister of Israel against all odds, really. Netanyahu's re-election in March would thankfully precede the nuclear framework deal with Iran, which took place on April 2nd. The handwriting was really on the wall at that point. Didn't come as any surprise when on April 13th, Russia lifted its ban on delivery of S-300 surface-to-air missile systems to Iran. Many Bible prophecy teachers, present company included, paid particular attention to a very well-known prophecy in Ezekiel 38, which is a prophecy about Russia and Iran along with an alliance of nations launching a nuclear attack against Israel and they are miraculously defeated by God him himself who alone stands with Israel when all nations have turned against Israel this brought us to the beginning of May with the eerie similarities between what happened in Ferguson again happening in Baltimore, Maryland. And May also started the Supreme Court hearing of the same-sex marriage case, which would ultimately become law in June of this year. May was also the month that 69 people from all over the world made a historic and prophetic trip to Israel for a study tour. Okay, that was us. That didn't make national news, but thought maybe some levity would be good. Actually, June was historic and prophetic when on Friday, June 26th, the U.S. Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage. Jesus said this would happen, did he not? He said that it would be like it was in the days of Noah and in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. So too would it be the same in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. You know, I... I almost reluctantly share this because I actually may talk more about this at a future update should the Lord lead me to, but, and I hope you don't misunderstand me when I say this, but in a sanctified way, I almost want this to happen. Now, before you stone me to death, <laughs> let me hasten to say the reason why. I'm almost glad that this is happening. The reason is, is because it means that my Jesus is coming soon. These things must come to pass that the end might come. When I see evil seemingly prevailing over righteousness in the world in ways that we could have never imagined, I think of Luke 21, 28, my favorite Bible passage in all of the Bible. Of course, all of the passages are my favorite, but this one particularly, where Jesus said, when you see these things begin, key word, begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. What things are we to look up when we see them beginning to come to pass? Oh, the prophecies that were foretold by the prophets of old, as well as the prophecies in the New Testament from the Savior himself. 
who gave us a rather detailed description of what the world would look like at the time of the end. And he did that so that we would be ready and watching. He says in John 14, 29, I tell you what's going to happen before it happens, so when you see it begin to happen, you will believe. We're seeing it begin to happen. Exactly as we were told it would. And it's happening in real time. For those who have eyes to see. Yes, we were grieved. Oh, were we grieved. Heartbroken. And not necessarily for the reasons one might think. I think of those who are deceived and caught up in this sinful lifestyle. Who have been lied to and told that it's genetic and not moral. And that lie from the father of lies has the propensity to send them to hell for all eternity. Wow, pastor, that's really strong. Yeah, but it doesn't break your heart. This Supreme Court ruling was on the heels of something else that was both historic and prophetic, namely the signing of the Iran nuclear deal. After extending one deadline after another, a deal was finally reached on Tuesday, July 14th, which was and still is, I believe, a game changer. This, this changes everything. That brought us to August, which was a very interesting month, and for a number of reasons, not the least of which was the following month of September. More specifically, all of the events converging around an already high watch time, as it's referred to with the Feasts of Israel, and it was interesting when August ended with the world's currencies, chief of which was the U.S. dollar beginning what many believe will ultimately lead to a global collapse. Well, Pastor, that's doom and gloom. Well, <laughs> I mean... That's what my Bible says. Who can forget September? What an ominous month. I think at last count there were some 33 specific events of prophetic significance that have been listed <laughs> as all converging in the month of September. And I knew in my heart that there was the potential for it to be very disheartening and very disappointing. And I know there were those who made September predictions. And I personally made a conscious effort to not get caught up in this whole September madness, but I do have to say that in September of this year, there were many things of prophetic significance that were set in motion, and I think that we will see some come to fruition in the upcoming new year. October came and went, and with it, the Islamic terrorist attack, don't want to call it that, at Umqua Community College, in which a total of nine Christians were martyred. This after the Muslim asked them, are you a Christian? And if they said yes, they were executed. 
That was actually on October 1st, if you might remember. And it ushered in a very interesting month, especially as things started to really heat up in Syria on the heels of Putin coming here for the UN General Assembly in September and making nice with the US. Not only did it heat up in Syria, unprecedented terrorist attacks in what some dubbed the Third Intifada ramped up in Israel with demon-possessed Muslims wielding knives and butchering Jews. November began with Netanyahu exposing the Palestinian Hitler connection with the continued days of rage, as they were called, against the Jews in full force. November was also the month that the Islamic propaganda gained traction, and it is Islamic propaganda in which they attempted to both rename and control the Temple Mount. November also brought us a stunning and devastating, and I mean stunning and devastating defeat of Canada's pro-Israel Prime Minister by a Muslim Prime Minister. Changed the whole complexion of Canada overnight. That brings us to the current month, December, we're about to bid farewell to, and with it the unthinkable Islamic terrorist attack in San Bernardino, California. This after the Islamic State terrorist attacks in France, which took place only two weeks prior, much to the world's astonishment, and one ha has to wonder why. One has to wonder why. And by that I mean, are we surprised? My wife and I were in London, England in 1997. And from our hotel room to the palace and all of the sites that we were going to see, we walked by two Islamic mosques, not one church. Not one church. By the way, those famous beautiful church buildings in England are now mosques. There were bumper stickers. 1997! If my math is right, isn't that about 20 years ago? There were bumper stickers that would said, London for Islam! That would be like seeing a bumper sticker that said, Kaneohe for Christ. England, France, Europe. Is it no wonder now that France, on the heels of a bloody year at the hands of Islam, is now waking up? I guess better late than never. Would to God that the United States of America would wake up before it's too late. Keep in mind <laughs> that this Islamic terrorism took place in concert. The, the backdrop with all of this was significant prophetic developments concerning Israel. Tremendous changes are taking place in Israel and it's fulfilling Bible prophecy. Time doesn't permit to talk about everything that happened in 2015. Example, how about the find of gas in the Golan? <laughs> oh, this after the natural gas find off the coast of Haifa, it, there in the Mediterranean Sea, a massive amount, so massive that Putin tried to make a deal with Netanyahu and Netanyahu refused. And Putin was willing to throw Assad and Syria with him under the bus, so to speak, in order for a stake in Israel's find. And now, 
what they could not get by peaceful means, they will seek to get by way of Ezekiel 38 by force. It's all coming together. It's all coming together. Suffice it to say, if this is just some of what happened in 2015, then wouldn't it stand to reason <laughs> that 2016 could bring about even more, especially given the prophetic momentum from this year? I read a very sobering article. I, I'm not going to share it with you. Um, I think we'll find out, but they are making a prediction. And you know, I'm, I never make predictions. <laughs> and, and today's not a, any exception. I'm not going to make any predictions for 2016. I am going to share two observations concerning 2016. But there are some who are predicting the unthinkable. January 1st and 2nd and 3rd, early on. I guess we'll see, but it has to do with the global economy. Weird things are happening, yeah? I mean, have you ever, it's, it's almost humorous in a way, I, I do get a chuckle out of it when I watch the so-called experts pontificate about the upcoming presidential election saying things like, quote, I've never seen anything like this before. Who knows? Who knows? Two observations, and I'll bring it in for a landing. The first observation has to do with Syria and the prophecy in Isaiah 17 concerning Damascus becoming a ruinous heap. I truly believe and still believe that we're on the cusp of this specific prophecy being fulfilled. One of the things my dad told me before he died was keep your eyes on Syria. Keep your eyes on Syria. And this was 1993. That was a long time ago. Keep your eyes on Syria. Now I'm starting to understand why. Syria is a catalyst, if you please. I would encourage you to read Joel Rosenberg's blog. He titles it, Eerie front page New York Times story examines ISIS prophecies about an apocalyptic showdown in Syrian town of Dabiq. He says, parenthetically, story looks ripped from the first hostage, my forthcoming novel about a showdown over Dabiq. Very good read. Both articles, Joel's blog and, and Rosenberg has an uncanny way of writing uh, novels, <laughs> fiction, that ends up bearing a, an eerie resemblance to reality. Uh, this whole apocalyptic showdown in the Syrian town of Dabiq is to establish the caliphate. This is what the Islamic State is all about. I don't know if you heard it was breaking just this morning, actually yesterday, that Al-Bakari has come out with about a 24-minute video in which he says, quote, Palestine, speaking of Israel, will become a graveyard for Jews and that attacks are coming. Now there's some speculation and even doubt as to how recent the video is because he makes no reference to San Bernardino, which he would have certainly wanted to take credit for. I have my own theory concerning San Bernardino. I think that these two Muslims jumped the gun, no pun intended. That they were just one of many cells of which there are cells in every state in the United States, even here in Hawaii, that are dormant 
and waiting for the green light. And this couple in San Bernardino did not wait for the green light. They snapped and they attacked. And that's interesting. You don't find that much weaponry in a home in America unless you plan to do much damage with it. But you have to understand that the reason that there are people joining the Islamic State is because they see the Islamic State's legitimacy when they capture more land to establish this caliphate. And the whole purpose of the Islamic State, the sole goal of the Islamic State is to wipe Israel off the map. That's why they call it, and that's why, by the way, and I know we've talked about it, that the president will only always refer to them as ISIL, which is the acronym for the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. The Levant being virtually identical to the original borders of the Promised Land. And every time anyone ever says ISIL, it is a smack in the face of the God of Israel. But this explains a lot. They're making gains. Yeah, they've taken a hit, but they're making gains. And they're capturing land in the so-called Levant to establish this caliphate. And as they do, it lends them legitimacy in the eyes of the Muslim world, who will then subsequently submit in allegiance to the Islamic State as and because of that caliphate. But this makes a lot of sense. It explains a lot as to why Syria is such a catalyst. The second observation, lastly, concerning 2016 has to do with an article that an online viewer from Washington State had sent me. It's a Time Magazine article titled, The Absence of Global Leadership Will Shape a Tumultuous 2016. Let me just quote a very interesting uh, part of this uh, article. Only a global emergency on a scale greater than anything we've yet seen can accomplish the bringing together of the entire world. Wow. It might be a war, a financial crisis, a public health threat, catastrophic terrorism, an environmental disaster, but the sort of crisis that forces a new level of global cooperation based on the world's true balance of power. When it finally comes, it will be the biggest story of our time. <laughs> what? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Revelation. One world government one world religion, one world economy under the control of the Antichrist on the heels of something so grand in its scale, the likes of which mankind has never seen before, i.e. the rapture. And then according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, the subsequent revelation of the Antichrist. Again, the Antichrist cannot be revealed. He's already, I believe, alive and well on the scene, behind the scenes. 
just waiting. And by the way, dare I say that the quote-unquote powers to be know about the rapture. What do you mean? Think about it. These people are not stupid. Satan is very intelligent. And by the way, he knows the Bible better than you and I know the Bible. He knows Bible prophecy better than you and I know Bible prophecy. And once the church is taken out of the way, everything begins to happen. And the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the church is removed. And it will begin the last seven years of world history, the seven-year tribulation, when God, because the fullness of the Gentiles is complete, he will shift the entirety of his focus to his plan for his people, the Jewish people, which is the purpose of the tribulation for the salvation of the Jewish nation. The time of Jacob's trouble, the 70th week of Daniel. We're on the cusp. We're on the cusp. There is a huge vacuum waiting to be filled by this charismatic world leader who cannot take his place on the world scene until we are taken out of this world scene. How close are we? How close are we? Two verses of scripture I think would be apropos. The first of which is 1 Chronicles 12, the first part of verse 32, where it describes the men of Issachar, of whom it was said, they understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Not only did they understand the times they were living in, they also understood and knew what they should do about the times they were living in. The Apostle Paul to the church in Rome, chapter 13, verses 11 and 12, says, this is what we're to do. Do this. Understanding the present time. That's a presupposition presupposing you understand the times in which you are living, the new year that you're about to step into, the last year that you're about to bid farewell to, when you truly understand that, presupposing that, this is what you're to do. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber. And here's why. Because... Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And we talked about this last week in the context of the Savior's birth. But it's always the darkest right before the light. It's always the darkest right before the light. And I think the world today is the darkest. And it means it's right before the light. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I implore you today to call upon him. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he rose from the dead you will be saved Romans 10 13 says all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved I hope you will once you all stand and we'll pray Lord, thank you. Thank you for telling us in your word what the world would be like before your return. 
Thank you for telling us what would happen before it happened so that when it happened we would believe and look up and lift up our heads knowing our redemption draweth nigh. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Maranatha. In Jesus' name, amen.